morning and welcome to our morning worship. Coming to you from Shankill Baptist Church in Tennant Street in Belfast. We do welcome you in the Lord's name. And wherever you're listening from, we trust and pray that this service will be a blessing to you. We meet to worship God, to praise Him, to give thanks for His goodness and His grace in our lives every day. Our service concludes with the remembrance of the Lord and the breaking of bread. And if you know and love the Savior and are walking in fellowship with Him, He invites you and instructs you to remember Him in this, His own appointed way. Our Sunday school meets this afternoon at half past three, and at the same time, our adult Bible class. And then we meet for prayer at half past six, prior to our evening service at seven o'clock. Our evening service is a community carol service tonight at seven with special musicians and guests taking part. Why not come along? Maybe you have received a, a, a leaflet like this in, into your home, maybe through the post, whatever. Come along and be part of our evening congregation as we worship God and give him thanks for the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus. Refreshments will be served at the close of our evening service. Wednesday night is our church night, half past seven, when we meet to praise God and to read his word and to learn from his word and to wait before him in prayer. So do keep that meeting in mind. Then the service is next Lord's Day at 11 in the morning and half past six, note the change of time, half past six in the evening. Our friends, and family carol servants and some of our young people in our Sunday school and others will be taking part in what is a great evening here in Shanka. So keep those two evenings in mind tonight at seven and next Sunday evening at half past seven. And in mind, keep in mind men, the men's fellowship on the 20th of December, Tuesday the 20th of December, a special evening when our special guests will be Fred Greenfield, who will come along to lead us in praise and to share God's word. These are all the announcements, and we make them subject to the sovereign will of God. Let's hear God's word as we gather to worship him this morning. The words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. With these words in mind, let's praise God in the singing of our opening hymn, Thou art the ever lasting word.
let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Shall we all pray? Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather in your house and to lift our hearts and our voices in praise and in worship, to be reminded again through your word that we have read and through these words that we have sung, who you are, the everlasting Father. We thank you that you are the God to whom there is no beginning and to whom there is no ending. You are the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. What a privilege it is this morning to meet here and to bring our praise and our worship to you, our God and Father in heaven. We come in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus. We bow humbly and reverently in your presence because we realize that you are of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. But we come with joy in our hearts and praise on our lips because of that new and living way that you have opened to us, whereby we who once were far from God can draw near through the merits of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son. And at this time of the year when our thoughts are drawn to the coming of the Christ child to Bethlehem long ago, we thank you this morning for the child that was born, for the son that was given, Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you, O God, for who he was and who he is and what he has accomplished. Lord, we pray that you will grant to us the help of the Holy Spirit so that our worship may be acceptable in your sight. We pray that you'll guide our thoughts, you'll guard our hearts. We pray that our lips will praise and worship you and magnify the God of our salvation. Forgive us again for all our sin. And help us, our Father, with clean hands and a pure heart to ascend the holy hill of God and to bring to our God that worship that is pleasing and acceptable in his sight. And this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this hymn emphasizes that. Eternal light, eternal light. Let's continue to worship God as we sing these great words together.
the Lord's presence as we come to him this morning in our intercessory prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that reminds us that you are our creator. Remember what the prophet said, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And our Father, it is with confidence that we draw near to your throne to bring our needs to you this morning, to cast all our care upon you because you have reminded us that you do care for us. We want to pray for one another. We want to pray for every home and every family and every need that is represented in our congregation today. We thank you that you are the almighty God, the God who is greater than all our problems and greater than all our fears, the God who gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Your word teaches us that even youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We thank you for those experiences of life that has caused us to cast ourselves upon the Lord and to find his grace and his strength to be sufficient, meeting our every need. We remember again in our prayers this morning the need of our church family, the need of this community in which we meet. We realize that since last we met together, there have been those who have been taken into eternity, some very young, some not so young. We pray for broken hearts this morning. We pray for homes that are shattered because of the passing of loved ones. Lord, we just commend these families and households to your love and to your care and to your grace. We think of those this morning who are laid aside. Some are struggling physically. Some are struggling emotionally. Lord, draw near to them and help them this morning uh, to look to you and to find that strength and that help and that comfort which God alone can give. We want to pray again for our province in all its confusion and chaos, our nation, a nation that has neglected God, and a, a nation that is continually and constantly and increasingly turning its back upon God. The word of God is disregarded. The laws of God are refuted. And oh God, there is an attitude of heart this morning that grieves the heart of our God, who has said, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach unto our God. We pray for those who are responsible, are responsible for making the laws. We pray for our legislators for our politicians. We pray again for our Prime Minister and his Cabinet. We pray for the Secretary of State and uh, the uh, ministers who uh, exercise uh, governmental authority. We ask, O oh God, that you will rule in the affairs of men and bring evil to nothing and cause men and women to sense their accountability to God the Almighty. Forgive us for our own sin, if we have neglected to serve you, if we have followed after things that have grieved you, Lord, be merciful toward us, and grant us to know that forgiveness that is found alone in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word, and as we read it shortly and meditate upon it, and then as we think again of our Lord Jesus Christ and the breaking of bread. May our hearts be strangely warmed as the Lord himself draws near. Father, we pray for the preaching of your word today throughout the length and breadth of our province. We remember the boys and girls in the Sunday school, the adult Bible class, and our evening carol service. We pray that this may be a great day for Christ and his kingdom, that the kingdom of God will be extended in the hearts and lives of men and women, men and women might know the blessedness of being at peace with God and experiencing God's peace which passes all understanding. Hear our prayer this morning 
receive our thanks and our praise and our worship. We offer them in our Savior's worthy name. Amen. Here's a lovely carol that we often sing at this season of year. As with gladness, men of old did the guiding star behold. Let's think again of our Lord Jesus as we rise to sing this carol together. chapter 1, John chapter 1, and the first 14 verses. This is God's Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word, and we thank God for his word today. As Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, we are convinced this morning that the greatest story ever told concerns, concerns the coming of the Lord Jesus into the world. For in that coming, he, the Son, revealed God the Father as a God of love. It's not an exaggeration to say that what distinguishes Christianity from all other religions is this agape love. John tells us in our text this morning that no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom, which is in the heart of the Father. He hath declared him. And whilst the Old Testament had foreshadowings of that love, it was not until the Lord Jesus came in the flesh that men and women truly saw the glory of God full of grace and full of truth. And so without doubt, the greatest story ever told is the coming of Jesus Christ into our world. In the verses before us this morning, we have three aspects of that coming which we should note with care. You see, when we think of the greatest story ever told, we think this morning of the story of the nativity of Christ. John tells us in his gospel record, he came unto his own. And this happened that first Christmas night in that little town of Bethlehem. At the precise time on the divine calendar, we are told that Christ the Lord was supernaturally born. Paul writes in Galatians 4, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. He came on to his own. And Jesus amplifies this when he says, The word became flesh. The word, of course, as one of our hymns reminds us, the word, of course, refers to the Son of God who contracted to the measure of a woman's womb in order to become man that he might become your Savior and my Savior. (coughs) And this miracle was affected by the Holy Spirit and so will ever remain a mystery to our finite minds. But there is no question about it. He was born as a little baby in a manger. The great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon writes, It was more humiliating for Jesus to become a man than it was for angels to become a worm. Yet Christ did not hesitate to become a man. He left the bosom of the Father for the breast of a woman. He laid aside his glory and appeared in a form that we could gaze upon and know that he is God. But just as important as this, Christ was sinlessly born. He came unto his own. And then we read that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. While all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Jesus was the exception. For his life was the manifestation of the glory of God, full of grace and full of truth. Because he was full of grace, He was blameless because he was full of truth. He was absolutely faultless. Friends, enemies, and the demons of hell could find no sin in him. 
But it doesn't end there. Because our story not only focuses our attention on the nativity of Christ, our story emphasizes this sad truth of hostility toward Christ. He came onto his own, and his own received him not. In spite of the fact that love came down at Christmas, the creatures of his own hand rebelled against him. The Bible teaches us that the world received him not. And John later tells us that this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so as we trace the story of man's hostility to the Son of God, we can spell out human rejection in three simple sentences. First of all, at his birth, there was no room for him in the inn. We read in Luke's account that Mary brought forth her firstborn son and led him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. However hard we try to rationalize that pathetic scene of Mary, there she was, burdened with child. She was turned away from the inn, emphasizing the fact that at his birth there was no room for Jesus. While shepherds and wise men sought to worship him, Herod and his religious leaders, the leaders of his day, sought to murder him. That's the part of the story we tend to ignore. Here's the hostility toward Christ. At his birth, there was no room for him in the inn. In his life, there was no place for him to lay his head. Jesus said on one occasion, the foxes of holes, the birds of the air, their nest, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Here and there, a home was open to him, but by and large, he was a stranger in the very world he had made. John says he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. What a commentary on the hostility of man. Were he, come, were he to come to our land this morning, were he to come to our community, were he to, co- were he to come to any other land, whether it be London or Los Angeles, whether it be Belfast or Brazil, whether it be Put it down or Peru, he would still be rejected, even in our so-called enlightened age. At his birth, there was no room for him in the inn. In his life, there was no place for him to lay his head. And at his death, there was no room for him. Joseph led the body of the Lord Jesus in his new tomb, which he had made out of the rock. Humanly speaking, were it not for Joseph of Arimathea, who had compassion on the Savior, there would have been no place to lay the crucified body of our precious Lord. The cross was the ultimate manifestation of man's hatred and rejection of Christ. And the tragedy is that the same hostility is still found in many hearts this morning. The fact that there have been those who have not bowed the knee, those who have not yielded to the claims of Christ, is the proof that men and women are basically hostile to this Savior. The old hymn puts it like this. Room for business, room for pleasure, but for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in the heart for which he died. One writer refers to this as the crime of Christmas. So as the story unfolds this morning, we 
we learn that it's a story about the nativity of Christ. It's a story about the hostility toward Christ. But thank God it doesn't end there. Because it's a story about the reality of Christ. Listen to what John says. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In spite of what we've said about man's hostility, there are exceptions. People from every part of the globe this morning, people in changing generations have discovered the greatest discovery that mortal men could ever find. And that discovery is that in Jesus Christ alone is found reality. And here in our text this morning, we are reminded as to how this can take place. First of all, we must believe in him. For as many as believe on his name, at the time of his birth, the angels announced that the eternal Logos, the eternal word, was to be called Jesus because he would save his people from their sin. And that is why he came into the world. You see, your problem and my problem, man's essential problem this morning, is sin. We don't hear about that too much in our radio and our television programs. We don't read too much about that in our newspaper. This is why Jesus came into the world. Because man, man's essential problem is sin. Everything that spoils the world today stems from the fact of sin. Man's greed is because of sin. Man's guilt is because of sin. Man's gloom is because of sin. And there's only one person in the universe that can deal with sin, and that is Christ the Savior. And so we must believe on Christ. But that's not all the story. Not only must we believe in Christ, we must receive Christ to many, but to as many as receive him. What does that mean? What does it mean to believe and what does it mean to receive? Well, to receive Christ means to recognize our need of Christ. It means to respond to God's mercy and love in the provision of his beloved son. It means to bow to his claims, to heed his call and to receive his gift. And the incoming of Christ into one's life creates a totally new relationship. We become children of God forever. Forever. We're not born children of God. We are children of wrath. God is our creator, but he is only the father of those who have received his son, recognizing their need. And with that relationship, that relationship to God, our creator, through Christ, his son, whereby he becomes our heavenly father, with that relationship, there are divine resources for us children. We're welcome at a father's table and there is no need in our lives which cannot be met and satisfied out of the fullness that God has given to his son, Jesus Christ. But not only are we involved in a divine relationship with divine resources, we have divine responsibilities to live out the character of God in a world that desperately needs to know him. And so... The glory of him who is full of grace and truth is to be seen in the lives of those who have received his son as Savior and Lord into their lives. It's the greatest story ever told. As you read through this opening sequel of John's Gospel that we read this morning, it's a story that never grows old. John presents to us many 
contrasting and compelling pictures of the Lord Jesus. And here at the very beginning of the gospel, we're reminded that Jesus is the light that has come into a world made dark by sin. And the light is revealed. Jesus is the true light that lights every man or person without distinction. The light of the world is Jesus. But I've already intimated the light is resisted. Nothing seemed to astonish John more than the resistance to Jesus. Looking back to the beginning of things, John was amazed at how quickly and how completely people, both Jew and Gentile, turned away from the light. John tells us how this divine light personified in Jesus Christ was resisted by the very creation that he had created. The world whom he had made did not recognize him. Every blade of grass he created. He knew about the creation of every plant. He knew the breadth of every lake and the depth of every ocean. Every deep and shallow place was known to him. Every pebble at the bottom of the seas, every fish swimming in all the waters that ever existed. The world was made by him. He knew all about astronomy and chemistry, physics and biology, mathematics and medicine. He knew every law known to science, not because he studied them, but because he is the author of them all. The eternal creator walked those Galilean roads and those Judean uh, Jerusalem streets, wisdom, love and power looked out of his eyes and were felt in the touch of his hands. He was in the world, the world that it made and the world that he opposed by his power did not recognize him. People rubbed shoulders with God but they were too blind to see. The Lord was resisted not only by his creatures, but also by his countrymen. He came to the Jewish nation, he came to the Jewish people, and they had no time for him. In spite of them being prepared through the prophets, and in spite of the fact that their cold former religious system echoed the need for one to come and breathe life into dead bones, Jesus was not the type of Messiah that they wanted. He didn't fit in with their schemes. Jesus tells us that this light was not only revealed, this light was not only resisted, but thank God this light was also received. We have, we have John to thank for one of those wonderful texts of scripture that are such a, a marked feature of his writings. Texts that open to the prayerful reader, the essence of God's plan of salvation. It's a divine stopping place that marks the road that brings us to an understanding of the wonder of God's saving plan. Thank God for the buts of the Bible, and we have one right here. But he came onto his own, and his own did not receive him, did not recognize him, they rejected him, but to as many, but to as many that receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the sons of God. Note the order. Believe, receive, become. The name, which is not mentioned here, of course, is the name of Jesus. Mentioned several times, 247 times it is mentioned. John, more than the other gospel writers, confronts his readers with the deity of Christ. But alongside that, he doesn't hide his humanity. But while reminding us over and over again that our Lord's humanity, John never forgets that he was more than human. So why the phrase, believe in his name? Why his name? Well, remember what the message was that was brought by the angel to Joseph, his earthly father. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. To believe in his name is to believe in what his name signifies. He came to save us from all our sins. And all that is meaningless if we do not recognize that we are sinners and he is the savior we need. We are to receive him, not just as savior or the savior, God desires 
that this Jesus who was coming into the world and who came into the world over a thousand years ago is to be my Savior, not just a Savior, not just the Savior, but my Savior. And as we receive him, so we become children of God who are born not of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. We can never become what we are. We, we can never become what we are, already are. We're not all the children of God. We're all created by God, but in order to be part of God's family, we need to become his children. And this takes place not by human descent. It doesn't run in the blood. Family likeness, no. Saving faith. Not by human desire. We're not brought into this relationship by wishful thinking or human imagination. Many pe people live in a world of fantasy, a world of make-believe, pretending to be what they're not. It's not by human descent. It's not by human desire. It's not by human design. No amount of parental or personal resolve can affect this miracle of saving grace. But where human descent and human desire and human design fails, God doesn't. It's in his son, the babe of Bethlehem, the man who the man, the one who became the man of sorrows. And at God's appointed time became the sacrifice of Calvary. This is the story that never goes old. The story of the nativity, the story of the hostility, the story of the reality. I wonder this morning. As you worship with us here, as you listen and tune into our service, I wonder this morning, are you entering into the true reason for the season? I referred to this verse earlier in my message. I close with it this morning. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, both under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. One translation puts it like this. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that we could be adopted, so that he could adopt us and make us his very own children. Oh, this morning, as we remind our hearts of the greatest story ever told, may it be a story that you will embrace, not only in your mind, but in your heart. May it be the means of transforming your life for God's glory and for all your, your eternal good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the revelation that you've given to us of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you this morning that here in him we have the greatest story ever told. May we allow your word to dwell in our hearts, to bring us again to that person of your Son, Jesus Christ, and to embrace him and confess him as our Savior and as our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing this lovely carol, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown.
as we come to the Lord's table this morning. We want to read some familiar verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. Paul writes, For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. You know, the book is a treasury of divine riches. It's a prophetical book telling us about the future. It's a practical book helping us in the present. It's a pictorial book bringing our attention to the past. There are many signs and symbols recorded in Holy Scripture to emphasize it, God's abiding truth. And while certain practices may be cultural, their principles are abiding. There are two great ordinances in the Word of God. One is the ordinance of believers' baptism, where the believer in Christ confesses their faith in God and their trust in Jesus Christ and their confession of him and their desire to follow him as Savior and Lord. They do that as believers in the waters of baptism by immersion. And then there's the ordinance of the breaking of bread. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we read that on the first day of the week, the disciples met together to break bread. You know, as we come this morning to break bread, we note the simplicity of this feast. Just bread and wine. Simple, yet profound. There's nothing in the bread, there's nothing in the wine that makes us right with God. They are symbols that remind us of a perfect and effective sacrifice in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They spell out this good truth, that Christ died for our sins, that he bore our sins in his body on the tree, that he shed his precious blood for sinners at Calvary. There's a simplicity here. There is a sincerity here. We come to eat of the bread and drink of the cup, realizing that the host is none other than the law of the Lord Jesus Christ that he is the host, and we are his privileged guests. He invites us to come. He instructs us to come. We're to come trusting in Christ. We're to come trusting not in anything that we have ever done or could ever do. We come confessing our need of a Savior. There's a significance in this feast. Paul says, I have received this from the Lord. We gather around this table not because it's the tradition of the church, not because it's the practice of a denomination, but we gather because Paul shares what he received from the Lord. The same night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. To this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And we gather here this morning because God has revealed in his word that we should gather. And that's enough. But you know, there's not only a simplicity here and a sincerity here and a significance. There is the sound, there's a proclamation, there's a sufficiency here that all that Christ has done for us 
meets not only our need in the past and the present, but in the future. And that's why we eat of this bread and drink of this cup all night till the Lord himself shall come. I've received from the Lord that which I deliver to you. So having thought about the simplicity and the sincerity and the significance and the sufficiency that this feast reminds us of, let's come, let's eat, and let's drink. And as we come to do that, we sing this lovely hymn, What Kind of Love Is This? What kind of love is this That gave itself for me pause to give thanks. Father, we thank you for this bread and for this wine that just reminds us again of our blessed Savior, your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. We cannot begin to understand and fully take it in that the Creator, the Lord of glory, hung upon that cross, pleading and died for sinners such as we. Lord, as we eat of this bread, help us to think about that. And as we drink of this cup, let's be mindful of his precious pardoning blood, which is all powerful. We eat and drink 
to bring honour and glory to your name. And mindful that all that we are and all that we have and all that we ever hope to be is only because of your amazing grace and eternal love. Amen. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary. He suffered. He died. Alone. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's drink. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence with us this Lord's Day morning. Thank you for these lovely hymns and carols that we've seen. We thank you for the greatest story ever told. And Lord, we realize that that story also involved a Savior who was born to die. To die that cruel death on the cross that we might live. We thank you that the cross is empty as is the tomb. For our Saviour rose from the dead and he's alive and lives forevermore at the Father's right hand, our great High Priest. Lord, we pray that we might know your peace and your presence throughout this day. Bless in the Sunday school and Bible class and bring us again to our carol service this evening. May all the honour and all the glory go to your great and glorious name. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this service has been a blessing to you. Remember our carol service this evening at 7. Why not come along to our candlelight carol service? You will be blessed. Bring others with you. We would love to see you this evening at 7 o'clock in Shankill Baptist Church. Carol's by candlelight. God bless you.